Yeah. You want to take any questions down? Yes. Okay, that's good. No, I should just try and think as I go along. <coughs> I should probably stop try halfway and through and try and remember what I'm trying to ask. <laughs> and you can help. Yeah. Who's going to say go? I will do. Are turning over? Yes, I'm turning over. And at speed, and in three, two, one. You're patron of what, 150 charities? Yes, it's 150 plus, in fact. Um, <laughs> So it takes up really quite a lot of my time. So where does the RNIB fit into your scale of things and scheme of things? Well, How much time can you allocate to it? I allocate at the moment really quite a lot of time because of the extra demands that are going on actually at the RNIB at the moment. And uh, this includes not only meetings and things like that, working meetings, but also includes, as it were, the public face of the RNIB as well. And of course the learning curve is quite steep because having never had anything to do with blind people or visually handicapped people, I've been trying to get around a lot of their facilities throughout the country, their schools and their special schools. And, of course, the nature of the, nature of the world as it is. Of course, they're not very close together. So they are very spread out. So why the RNIB, though, out of all the charities? Why, why this one? Well, it, that's a very difficult question to answer, actually, because I'd never had. Usually, if one becomes president or patron of a caring charity like the RNIB, it normally comes about by the fact that you've had somebody in the family who's been personally affected by it. I haven't, and I was approached by the RNIB, and like so many other people, I knew about the RNIB. I didn't exactly know what they did. I didn't know the services they provided. I didn't know the scale of the problem. Um, of blind and visually handicapped people in this country. And I started to ask questions, and uh, I didn't accept immediately. But having found out um, about what they did and what they were trying to achieve, I was hugely impressed by them. I mean, like so many of these caring charities, you and I sit back really quite comfortably, and we say we're very happy that they exist, without actually quite knowing what they do. And um, we rather regard them as a safety net. And I've discovered this on a number of charities, actually, which I've subsequently become involved with, that that safety net exists, but we don't really know what they do and what they're trying to achieve. And having found out what they were trying to do and trying to achieve, I had no hesitation at all um, in agreeing to become their president. So you're, you're not, in a sense, cynical, because a lot of people must ask you to be president of their charity, and, and you have to take care to decide which one you're going to go into. You're not, in any sense... Um, I suppose not cynical, nervous about taking on something else because of what's expected of you? Um, I'm sometimes a bit nervous, yes. Um, I turned down um, one or two. I remember I was asked to be president of the Wrexham Tropical Fish Society, for example, and I didn't know an awful lot about tropical fish, so I thought <laughs> I'd give that a miss. Um, I was asked to be president of a cat society, and I fear I'm not. Cats and I don't exactly get on terribly well together, so um, I turned that down. No, I mean, that is the flippant answer. The, the, the serious answer is actually that now, having really done this mm -hmm. for some 20 years or more, uh, one becomes much more inquiring about the organisations that I'm going to become associated with. I think 20 years ago, you found it rather flattering if somebody asked you to be president of something, and especially a national organisation like the RNIB. But now I think, I'm not cynical, I'm much more inquiring, because in the final analysis, time is very expensive, and indeed it's very important, especially with a young family. And really to waste time, and have your time wasted, in activities which you feel that you're not making a contribution to, or not making a good contribution to, I think is one of the most distressing things in the world. Very often I come back at night thinking, God, that was a waste of time. I don't feel that I was used and I was worked properly, and I don't feel that I made the proper contribution. I'm trying to get that out of my system. And the RNIB know only too well that when I go somewhere, they know that everything has got to be a plan quite well, but B, I do need to leave feeling that I've been used correctly and been used properly. Are you going to raise, is it £10 million pounds for the RNIB? Yes, marginally over £10 million. Pounds. What happens if you don't? Sorry, if I just do that once again, sorry. <coughs> okay. Uh, you're going to raise £10 million pounds for the RNIB? Yes, marginally over £10 million. Pounds. And if you don't raise £10 million? Pounds? Well, um, I don't dwell upon not raising £10 million pounds too much, because I think that's a negative way of looking at it. Would you lob in money of your own if you didn't get to the required... Uh, I will be making a contribution of my own. Um, that is undoubtedly... I mean, that, that will happen. But I just won't top it up, 
just for the sake of topping it up. I mean, the money will be raised. Because I wondered, if you get to, say, eight million and you're president of the RNIB, it's terrible admission if you can't raise extra two million. I, I wondered how you might go about raising that, how, how you might go about saying, yes, I reached my target, I was a good president mm. of the RNIB, and I can step back now and say I've done a good job. Yes, I mean, I've taken on two or three national appeals, and um, it's never happened to me yet. Touch wood. And I don't intend this to happen, really, for the first time now. I mean, yes, it would be very easy for, for me to say, you know, of course, one well, chuck in an extra two million, but I don't envisage that happening. Um, it doesn't even cross my mind, because the money will be raised. Does it matter that you have to be rich to be an, a, a, the head of a charity like the RNIB? Well, I think in the days of fundraising at the moment, which of course has changed so very radically over the last decade, I think there are an awful lot of people out there who do look to see what the chairman or indeed president has given, and very often they give accordingly. So I think it probably helps in that respect. I think where the help that I can be is opening doors that would otherwise be closed to the RNIB. Bearing in mind the RNIB have never run a national appeal before. They've never gone national. They're not known by the City of London. They're not known by the industrialists of this world. So we have to start from a very low base in that all the ground that the RNIB are now in fact preparing for this large appeal is all new ground. They have no existing support amongst the city and amongst the industrial um, sector of the community and the giving part of the community. So it's all new ground. So this ball tonight, how much work did you put into it? Uh, I've put in a certain amount of work into it, um, certainly in the, as it were, the planning of the framework of it. Um, and uh, I can't say quite honestly, and I wouldn't even attempt to say that I put in a huge amount of work because I've got other things to do. But the principles were very clearly laid out at an early stage, principles of how it was going to be run, the principles of where it was going to be, in fact, and uh, what we hope to achieve out of it. So it's going to be done at Cliveden? It's going to be done at Cliveden, oh, yes. So the principles behind it are what? I mean, what kind of people are you hoping to attract there? Well, first of all, what we want to do is say thank you to our existing supporters, um, of which we now have a very considerable amount. And the other objective is to, is, is to elicit further support from um, supporters, we hope, that will come forward in the future. We want to introduce a lot of new people into the work of the RNIB. It's more of an introductory ball, as it were, instead of, uh, as you may think of a ball of this type, as a hard-nosed fundraising activity. Yes, we will raise money, because that is the second objective. But the first objective is to really solidify the, ex the, the support from our existing supporters and indeed create new supporters as well. So you're introducing members from the city, men from the city, exactly. as well as artists of, of one kind or another, so you have a melting pot a little bit Absolutely. there. Absolutely. And then you go afterwards and you say, come on, take part in yes. the campaign. Then we will follow them up very rapidly afterwards. I mean, their feet won't have even got off the dance floor um, the next morning so before someone is there eliciting their support. So you've obviously used this tactic before? Yes, I have, yes. And it works? And it's worked very well. Because, I mean, in the final analysis, what I am trying to do is ask very busy people to give up really quite a lot of time. I mean, nobody can be under the illusion that if they join an appeal of this scale, that it's not going to take time up. I mean, the biggest lie in this world is, will you lend your name? Because as soon as you lend your name, you've got three people in the office asking you to do things. So I never work on that principle. I work on the principle, listen, we have a very major job to be done, and uh, it is going to take time. And we are going to ask you to ask your friends and ask your business contacts and your business colleagues. And I make no illusion about it. However, it will be 12 months, and j at the end of that 12 months, the job will be done. You've got how much in the kitty so far? It's just, just over two and a half million. So you have eight and seven and a half million left to, to raise? We have seven and a half million left to raise, and but it's not beyond the wit of man to do it. It's going to be tough. I don't underestimate the job at all, um, because the last major appeal I ran, we did in fact do it in 14 months, um, but we overshot the target, and very substantially overshot the target. These appeals get ahead of steam, and they're very slow to start, but they're very difficult to finish, because once the head of steam has been built up, you have local groups, local organizations, you've got companies who need a very substantial lead time in, in order to organize their activities and indeed their giving. So I, I don't see that in the final analysis there is going to be a problem raising that extra eight million. However, it is going to be done through hard work. 
you're, you're obviously optimistic there's enough money left around to put into an appeal like this. We keep on hearing these dire warnings that money isn't as readily available, the money's going out of the country, but you obviously have different experience of it all. Yes, I think that inherently um, we are actually a very generous society, contrary to popular opinion. We are a generous society, and I think if we can make our case correctly, and we can do it in a professional way, there is always money there to be got. We have to clearly think up of new ideas on how to raise money. Um, we have to we, we, we have to project the RNIB as a caring charity which the corporate sector would like to be linked with, would like to, be, uh, like to do business with in one way and or another, whether it be through sponsorship deals or not. We want to project the RNIB as this caring charity which I think people will respond to. I mean, there is an old adage in life, when, when was it ever easy to raise money? Um, in my experience, which now goes back a little time, it's never been easy to raise money. Whether one was talking about 1984, 85, 86, 87, when reputedly there was more money around in, term of in terms of corporate profits, um, it wasn't easy then, and it's not going to be easy now. Well, maybe many people would say you, know, you shouldn't be bothered at all raising money. A million people mm. depend upon the RNIB for funds. Why should the RNIB go to people like you and ask you to help raise money when it should be the government's responsibility. Many people would say you're allowing the government to wiggle out of its responsibilities. Well, yes, and this uh, particular attack has been thrown at me on a number of occasions when one, is, um, when one is raising money particularly for caring charities. I think there is no doubt, actually, in the caring field that the charitable sector is better at it than the government. People respond to charities very much better, whether one's talking about child abuse or whether one's talking about, um, about visually handicapped people. I think the charities which have been running in the final analysis, like the RNIB since 1886, they have a wealth of experience behind them on how to cope, and they have a, a wealth of knowledge. And we do need, yes, government support in, in part, but we're not going to go out and uh, we're not going to go out permanently with a begging bell to government and sort of say, will you do this, will you do that? Government make their contribution in different ways rather than just hard cash. But I believe there is a very important part for the charitable sector in the caring societies. And uh, people undoubtedly do respond to charities very much better than they do actually to the, to the large and rather daunting face of government. But if you raise, say, 10 to 14 million pounds mm. this time around, and it, it lasts for I don't know how many years, I don't know what your projections are, you're going to have to go back to the public at the end of, say, a five-year period and say, we want more money. How can you expect people to give more money when perhaps another charity is building up a head of steam too, mm -hmm. wanting money from them too? How can you expect them to come through with it yet again? Well, this appeal, first of all, is um, very carefully targeted at certain different projects. And those projects, um, once built and once running, aren't going to require huge sums of money from the public in the future. The RNIB is over 100 years old, and this is the first time it's ever been public, um, and uh, it's the first time they've ever asked people for money in the widest sense. And I would not envisage that once this appeal is over, I would not envisage that there would be a, a large appeal by the RNIB again for some time. I mean, charities do go back to the public, um, but there is no doubt that having raised the profile of the RNIB, we will see an increase in our income anyway, um, because this has happened again in the past, that once the profile of a charity has been raised, there is undoubtedly an increase in the income flow thereafter, because the profile has been raised. Now, the money that we're raising at the moment are for targeted and specific projects, and they are capital projects, which, in my view, certainly, and indeed hopefully, will be built, and uh, they will not require large capital sums after that. But Can you give me an idea of the kind mm. of project that you would like the RNIB to spend the money on? Yes. What um, stems to your heart? Well, I think one of the first ones that really comes to my heart is a, a um, capital projects for a school in Shrewsbury. Now, this is not localised to Shrewsbury. The children that go to that school, they come from as far north as Aberdeen and as far south as the, Ger as, as the Channel Islands. So it is a national school. And they are not only visually handicapped, they also have very serious behavioural problems. Now, we need to build extra classrooms there, um, and we need to build extra facilities in order that those children can get the required care and, indeed, the required learning 
uh, facilities and indeed learning abilities. And I, I, I have that one particularly close to my heart um, in relation to the RNIB because I think for two particular reasons. I mean, these children are suffering from, I mean, almost multi-handicap. I mean, they're not only visually handicapped, but as I say, they've got very serious behavioral problems and other problems as well. And I think it is hugely important to support that. And the other reason, undoubtedly, is the quality of the staff there. Um, the staff are simply <laughs> unbelievable. I was there actually only about three weeks ago. And whether <coughs> there was something going on that made the children very jumpy and really quite difficult and quite awkward, and they were being awkward too. Um, and when you have very serious behavioral problems such as that, of course, children do become very awkward indeed. And the patience and the love that those staff were showing those children was just simply unbelievable. I mean, I could not do it. And I think that's why I respect it so hugely. So really for those two particular reasons, and Condover is close to me in the northwest of England, and I know it well. And that is one specific project which I have very close to my heart. The other projects are clearly as important. Um, the RNIB is the largest braille producer in Europe. And the leading edge of technology in terms of producing braille, of course, are advancing the whole time. And in order to keep our preeminent position in the production of braille, we do need new technology um, to ensure that the braille production continues and it is of sufficient quality because a, an enormous amount of people rely on our talking book service, which perhaps the RNIB are better known for than most things. And uh, we need over a million pounds indeed to invest in that Braille service in order to bring it up to what is now becoming the leading edge of technology. You spent a short time um, wearing a pair of glasses which you could only partially see through. Yes. So that you, uh, was it the first time that you'd experienced being either partially sighted or blind? Yes, it is. And um, I find it very daunting. I did it, um, I, I tried to make a cup of coffee when I was partially blind, and I thought that was really rather difficult. But to do it when you're completely blind, I mean, just everyday things. I mean, this is what you and I take, for example, uh, take, take um, for, 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 um, for granted. And uh, to go into a kitchen and make a cup of coffee and pour it into a cup, which would, under normal circumstances, take one five minutes, took me the thick end of 45 minutes. And even then, I had most of it over the floor. Um, and I burnt my fingers as well. Mm. And I've, I found that a very humbling experience, actually. Um, and uh, I found it a terribly difficult one to, 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 to overcome. But I was disorientated, like other people who did go in for blind for a day, somebody like Jon Snow, for example. He went completely blind in a street and found it one of the most terrifying things he'd ever done because he could hear traffic rushing by. He could hear people rushing by. And he found that very disorientating and actually very frightening indeed. You see, we do suffer. I mean, for those of us who are fortunate enough to be able to see, I mean, my dread is never being able to see another English spring again, for example. Um, my dread is never to being able to see another May, the month of May. And there is a huge amount of misunderstanding amongst the British public. And the vice chairman of the RNIB, who is blind, was launching the appeal the other day, and he told a story and it was told against him and against blind people. And he was in an underground station, and he had a guide dog with him. And he stopped someone and said, where were the steps? And this person leant down and told the guide dog where the steps were. And that is the level of misunderstanding that we have to face amongst uh, the great British public, who are very kind to blind people, um, but some of them are perhaps do misunderstand their problems. And that story, whereas it has its humor about it, does send a very strong message on the level of misunderstanding there is amongst the general public about blind and visually handicapped people. You said to me a minute ago that you dread not seeing another May. Mm. Did you come to that thought after being blind for a day? Yes. I'd always thought about it, ever since I'd been involved in the RNIB, and having seen having seen children and elderly people who can't see properly, whether they are partially sighted or totally blind, um, it, it, it has struck me. And I think because we've had three good Mays in a row. Um, and uh, it particularly hit me when I couldn't see anything at all, when I was blinded. And not to see the change of seasons, to me, would be the worst of losing the five great senses. And I really regard my sight as really by far the most important. And uh, I think particularly for that reason. But if I could never see another change of season, I would go mad, I think. 
So after you've raised the money, will you then step down and allow other people to spend it, or will you be here every step of the way? I will continue, clearly, to be president of the RNIB after the appeal. The appeal is just a passing phase in um, what is a very much longer-term job. Um, I will undoubtedly be asking and indeed inquiring, and I think with a lot of other people whose support that I have now elicited and who have become committed to the RNIB, I think we'll be there and thereabouts ensuring that the money is correctly spent and indeed that the money that we raise, we're asking our friends, we're putting our reputations on the line, that the money that we raise is actually going to the projects the money has been raised for. Sometimes, without mentioning no names and no pactrol, I have actually been involved in appeals where it has been extremely difficult to get the organisations involved to actually spend the money for what we raise it for. Mm -hmm. And I think there is a very strong moral question on that. And uh, it, interestingly enough, has been those who have raised it, those who have tapped their friends, those who have uh, put their reputations on the line, who have actually changed the direction of a society and said, no, we raise money specifically for these projects and the money must be spent on it, no matter what pressure it creates mm -hmm. within other parts of the organisation. It must be spent on the money that we ra uh, on the projects that we raise it for. So is that what's going to happen with the RNIB? Yes. You're absolutely certain about the, the way the money certain. is going because to Because as I say, I've had experience two or three times before when organisations have got themselves into difficulty um, in other areas and they've thought, gosh, we have this huge slush fund now running around, we must use it for other things. I don't subscribe to that at all. You've learned a lot in your 39 years, an <laughs> immense amount in your 39 years. Can you actually f work out all these wrinkles at this, at this stage? There are a lot of wrinkles. Yes. There are a lot of wrinkles. Uh, let me just finally ask you, because it's a problem I suppose a lot of people listening to this might have. Uh, the Guide Dogs for the Blind Association mm. obviously raises a tremendous amount of money, and they're yes. apparently awash with money. Mm. Uh, uh, how, d how are you going to get the message across to the public that it's not for the Guide Dogs for the Blind, that it is for a completely different organisation? Well, how we're going to do it, um, that is a subjective judgment. I mean, we have to and must. I mean, and that's not taking anything away from the Guide Dogs, which I'm also involved with. Mm. I think the Guide Dogs for the Blind is the most marvellous organisation. Um, but what we have to do is, as you cr correctly point out, we have to draw this very clear distinction between what the Guide Dogs for the Blind do and what we do. And I think we'll be able to get that, I think we'll be able to get that over. Um, and of course, the Guide Dogs clearly uh, do have a lot of money um, and they do a hugely important job and uh, that is up to us mm -hmm. to draw that distinction uh, between the two organizations that is not to say that the two organizations are so far apart that we don't talk to each other or anything like that we do and we have a very close link and clearly a very close liaison however the two organizations are providing a service for blind people and uh, so in that respect, our aims and objectives are exactly the same. However, what we have to do is draw the distinction between the services that we actually give to blind people. Yes, or even go along to the Guide Dogs for the Blind Association and say, hey, come on, you can give us some of your money. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. That was Thank very you good very much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>